we're actually at 30 or so right here, and yet you have the stocks falling 30, 40 percent today. So what is that telling us? So I think the key takeaway here is the structural component of this lack of an agreement, right? Sure, it is surprising that they couldn't agree in a recession to cut, but ultimately it's not unexpected in a way because since 2016, they've made an artificial cut, which was not in their economic interest. And I think what you may be seeing on the equity side, which is taking a long-term view on the sector, is ultimately we may be unwinding this uneconomical cut. Think of it that way. Since 2016, OPEC and Russia production is down 4.4 million barrels per day. The rest is at 5.7. You know, at $60 oil prices, that's $200 billion wealth transfer every year from one sector to the other. So I think what the market is saying is, are we finally moving back to what would be the rational market structure, low-cost producers, namely Saudi, Russia, growing production over time, and the more marginal producers that indeed do not work at those prices, simply not having to be around for the next but several even years. But even if, if it goes back to Russia and Saudi, they're low-cost producers, sure, absolutely. But they have high break-evens for their budgets, do they not? So, so sure, even if that wealth transfer goes back, they come out ahead, U.S. shale production goes down, and, the, and oils where? Still $40 a barrel? I mean, doesn't that still hurt their finances? So in the short term, that's always the case. It's always better off to cut production to support prices for both economies. Although Russia's break-even is $45, whereas Saudi's is somewhere between 80 and 85. The key, though, is let's look three years from now, right? If they do manage to increase production and prices recover from here, maybe it's not 60, but even if it's 50, 55, by then both economies are better off, right? Saudi's fiscal deficit is at least half as small by 2022 than in this kind of flat production, stable price environment. So that's why, you know, there are long-term economic benefit to doing this market share defense, and now is an opportune time to do it. But they want us gone. Don't you agree? Yeah, I mean, they want to squeeze us. Yeah, we're, right? we're the high... I mean, we're the high... We... And, and, and we're and the ones who have increased production, correct. even as they have... Four million, four million barrels a day out of U.S. production has come online in the last two years. And if you're Russia or Saudi Arabia, number one, you can print money. Even Exxon can't do that yet. And number two, you've, you're looking at the global oil market and thinking these high-cost producers who have been living on debt, who just got here a couple years ago, are screwing up our market. I'm not saying I agree with that view, but that's their view. And they know how weak they are. And maybe the there's a view hands. That, that they can squash the industry. Quickly, there's one other thing we have to bring up, and Brian's been on this. We've talked about it on our show that Brian's been doing a great job with. This Thanks. whole ESG investing is a complete existential risk to the entire space that came at the exact wrong time for all of them. And I can't tell you, it is a big deal. And just look at the, you know, ExxonMobil in an environment when it should have been trading higher was not. Now, obviously, things are going pear-shaped. I get it. But if you don't think ESG has anything to do with this, you're just not paying attention. Just, and that's not going away. What about the tobacco stocks, though? I mean, we, there was huge divestment that led to huge returns for those stocks. So I, I totally take your point. There's massive capital coming out of the energy space, but is it really going to stop or slow down it, production? It takes, it takes time, though. It didn't yeah. happen overnight. Yeah. And, and things move so much faster now than they did when that happened. So it's, listen, it will sort itself out, but this is happening in terms of the ESG. It's happening at light speed, yeah. right before our eyes every single day. To your point, it will figure itself out, but it's not going to happen tomorrow. What percent of the, of the shale producers in the United States are going to be here in five years? So, you know, I think when you look at the structure of shale, there's about a third of production that comes from very small producers. You know, in the Permian, there are a hundred of those small producers. And I think that's the key, right? When we say high-cost producers, first of all, it's not just shale. You have other countries that are high-cost producers. Uh, but in the case of shale, it's really moving away from a fragmented industry funded by external capital to grow quickly, which was at the time what was needed, to a rationalized industry with fewer, larger producers with much lower cost of capital. Um, so that's a transition that had to take place anyway. It was drawn out over the last Question four years. Question for you, though. So we're watching the price of everybody in the energy sector down today. And one thing everyone seems to agree on is consolidation. So why aren't the smaller players? And we know in a vacuum, the smaller players look worse off. Ain't going to happen. Shouldn't there be any bid under no. the price of these names today no. if they're the going to be rolled up? Consolidation is not, not why, would, why wouldn't it happen? Because the value of the reserves in the ground have no value. There's no value. In fact, in some cases, it might be a negative cost. You know, if you... That, that's the issue right now. Now, right now, things turn around. Maybe you would agree. I know you're not a stock guy, Damien, but the, you're going to be taking on a lot of debt. Now, if the debt gets restructured from some of these companies, mm -hmm. 
and the price of oil stabilizes, you could see it. But right, private equity is full up. They are maxed out on their energy investments. To your point. What about the Exxons, the Chevrons? But it goes back to, right, to cut costs. if you have excess leverage, you have to kind of buy back all that debt to acquire the assets. So let the assets decay and eventually the rock is still there, right? By so the, the asset rock, itself instead of the debt that comes with it. The what, rock have value over the long term. The company around it may not have in this environment. What is the overall production in the United States today in bar barrels of oil? Sure. So uh, U.S. is actually bigger because if you include NGLs, then we're nearly 19 million barrels per day. Crude that itself... Include natural gas liquids. Exactly. Crude itself is about 14 million barrels. But for, what would it be in a few years? So, you know, shale I don't think is going away, right? We're not making the case that this is the end of shale. You know, even if Saudi, uh, Russia increased production, they have finite amount of spare capacity, right? So three, five years from now, we still need growth elsewhere. Now, the swing factor, I think, will be Libya, Iran, Venezuela, right? That can completely change the timeline. But again, three to five years from now, U.S. is still producing oil, probably at those levels, if not higher. That's a human story. You think about Venezuela, what's already gone on there, it's just only going to get worse. And for a lot of people, Midland, Texas, there's going to be big job losses and projects that don't get underway in a state that has arguably powered the American economy that's and why did power it out of the, the Great Recession.